Hi, I'm Candice. Uh, I am a technical sales manager here at RBR, and I'm actually based in Halifax. I'm at Cove. I'm looking at the water right now. It's, it's a very beautiful site. Um, so I'm just going to start sharing my presentation. Let's do this. <clears throat> All right, um, wait for that to get up. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna put this somewhere, oops, out of the way. Mm, up there's probably fine. Okay, so today I'm gonna talk about uh, wave measurements using uh, RBR instruments. As I said, I'm Candace Smith. I'm a technical sales manager here at RBR. I'm going to try to talk slowly, which is not my norm, but I will do my best. Uh, feel free to ask your questions in the Q&A box or in the chat. Um, yeah, and let's get going. Okay, so today we are going, uh, sorry, I'm just gonna move myself. I'm going to talk about um, three main things. I'm gonna spend most of the time on the first section, which is selecting the right wave instrument for your research goals. I'm gonna show you Ruskin and how powerful it is, which is our software to get the most out of your RBR wave instruments. And I'm gonna finish up by talking about best practices to ensure you, your deployment is successful. Okay, so choosing the right wave instrument. Uh, I've been working with people for quite a while now, on um, wave projects and helping customers figure out the very best way to measure waves. So I'm taking some insights and common questions from that, uh, from those conversations to start this to, to talk about this today. And we'll talk about what you actually need to capture waves and then which RBR solution is right for your deployment and why. When I get into these insights, feel free if I miss anything to put it into the chat because I wanna learn more as well. If there's other things, other requirements uh, that, I'm, that I'm completely missing, feel free to add those in. Um, so very, very broadly, the three main things are a wave instrument needs to capture waves. And that might seem really obvious, but it's not. And I'm gonna get into that in a little bit more detail. Um, it actually needs to be user-friendly. In the time of COVID, for example, lots of people couldn't actually get out to the deployment site. So being able to say, take a logger and explain to somebody how to set it up easily is really key. And it needs to be cost-effective. I'm gonna talk about the costs uh, in a slightly different way, I think, than uh, you think about it in terms of, it's not just the costs on the quote. There are many, many other costs to think about when you are doing a wave deployment. Okay, so <clears throat> really there's three main pieces to capture waves. And the first is that it's fast sampling. And by that, I mean, you're sampling more than once a second. So one Hertz means once a second, four Hertz means four times a second. So you really need to actually sample quickly and fast to capture waves. Uh, you also need to be able to deploy an instrument for weeks or months. So leave it in the water and have enough battery and memory that you can do fast sampling and have it in the water for an extended period of time. And you need to make sure that you're actually well sampling the waves. So there's a rule of thumb that you really want a hundred wave cycles in every burst. So typically we capture waves by doing burst sampling. So you're turning the logger on, sampling quickly, and then you're repeating that cycle over and over. And really sometimes some instruments you get a combo of two things, but not all three. So we're gonna talk about how RBR hits all of these three points. <clears throat> the user friendliness. So sometimes for certain instruments, you know, do you actually need to be a full wave expert and know all the theory behind waves to set up an instrument correctly? Do you need to be a technical expert to actually use the software and put it in the water? Um, something as simple as like, how long does it actually take to set up a logger if you're going out uh, for a deployment, are you going to need a full day to set up your instrument? Uh, and how easy is it to change the settings? If you buy an instrument today, can you use it for a deployment in five years for a different configuration? Is that easy to do? Can you use it in multiple settings? These are just lots of questions that come up while we're having these conversations with folks who are interested in measuring waves. Okay, and the third piece, and I mentioned this very briefly, that the cost of data collection isn't just the bottom line cost of an instrument on a quote. So a lot of people uh, think that that's what it is, that that's the price is the price, but there are many, many other costs, which I've <laughs> narrowed down as much as I possibly could. So there is a cost of going into the field to collect your data. If you deploy an instrument and you have to go back every week or every few days to collect the data, there is a cost associated with that. 
Maybe it's your time, which often we uh, don't consider a cost, but it is our most important resource this day and age. Uh, the cost of, are you going out and boat? Do you need to rent a truck? The cost of your students being out and constantly collecting the data and coming back, collecting the data, coming back. Same thing with technicians, you have to pay these folks. Um, and you know, what's the, what's the autonomy cost? Again, back to that Venn diagram. Are you sampling fast enough, often enough to actually capture the waves? And do you actually have the instrument in the water for the whole time that you need it in the water to capture a particular uh, event? Um, there's the cost of consumables. So consumables are the things that you use up uh, on, on an instrument. So are they proprietary? So does it have to be replaced by the manufacturer? Uh, can the user do it? Are they easy to find? And there's also this uh, back at factory cost. So <clears throat> that is how often are the manufacturers recommending a calibration? So how often do you need to send it back? What is the actual cost of the calibration? Is it as much as the instrument? And when it is back at the manufacturer, how long is it actually taking while it's there? What's the cost of you not having that instrument in the water? If you're doing a two year long deployment and you need to get something calibrated, say at the year point, is it gonna be out of the water for three months, six months? And how is that gonna affect your, your data? So the cost isn't just, again, the bottom line cost. There's many, many other costs to data collection. So at RBR, we can capture waves because we have these three intersections. So uh, any RBR instrument essentially can do this. I'm gonna just focus kind of on the high level and then I'll get down to one particular instrument and a bit more detail. So we do have fast sampling. With the wave 16 feature, you can get up to 16 Hertz sampling and 16 Hertz bursts. There's super excellent battery and memory autonomy, which means you can get these months, months long deployments. And we have this wave bursting capability. So like I mentioned earlier, typically you measure waves by bursting on, sampling quickly and repeating that cycle over and over. So this is from a past uh, webinar. So I just put a bit.ly link here. You can screenshot it. We'll share the resources also uh, tomorrow or Friday, we'll send it an email, but essentially very, very high level. If you sample at four Hertz for 40, 96 samples, that's about 17 minutes of data. And that's a very common, well sampled wave burst. So at RBR, one of the best features, one of the best things we have is Ruskin, which is our software. It's used actually internally at RBR. I personally use it every single day. It is free. You can download it. Feel free to stop listening to me right now and go and download it for the next part of the webinar. Uh, it works on Mac. It works on PC. There is no licensing. And it's really useful for your planning and your autonomy calculation. So I'm going to get in that into that a little bit more in the next section when I actually bring up Ruskin and show you some of the planning uh, capabilities such as what wave periods can I capture based on this setup. So the easy to set up piece is really Ruskin. It's super easy to do it there. Uh, and it's really flexible. So the wave 16 feature actually allows you to do continuous sampling or wave or tide bursts. So the continuous sampling is continuous pressure data, that's how we measure waves at RBR, or you can do the wave sampling, which will give you burst data and you get all of these different parameters like significant wave height, significant wave period. Uh, you can also use the instruments in different environments, freshwater, marine environments, it doesn't matter, They're, uh, they can be used in any environment like that. Okay, so the cost piece of this, which is uh, the cost of going into the field to collect the data. So how often do you need to go into the field versus how often do you want to go into the field? So ideally people want to put their instruments out for the entire deployment that they want to do. So it could be three months or six months. And often they need to go into the field before that to download the data or to change the batteries or something like that. So at RBR, we have really, really, really efficient electronics, which means you get excellent battery life out of AA batteries. Also with this wave burst sampling that I mentioned, you can really optimize your deployment setup. And I'm gonna talk about that again in the next part. When I talk about Ruskin, I'm gonna show you my favorite tip. Um, the consumables piece. So at RBR, we have three consumables, O-rings, desiccant, and AA batteries. Um, the support kit that comes with the logger actually has spare O-rings and spare desiccant. Also the desiccant is rechargeable. I'm gonna talk about that a little bit later as well. 
The batteries, the AA batteries can be any chemistry. So you can use alkalines if you don't wanna use lithium batteries, for example. And like I said, these are all user replaceable. So uh, the consumables piece is actually a relatively inexpensive cost um, using RBR instruments. And finally, the cost of being back at the factory. So how often do we recommend calibration? For most of our sensors, it is yearly. We have super excellent specifications again, so that, your, that the, the pressure sensor, for example, can detect these uh, like small surface waves. So once a year, we recommend the instrument coming back. I'm not gonna go into the specs today. I don't have enough time, but we can talk about that more later if you wanna reach out. Um, the calibration cost, we actually sell calibration vouchers uh, if, when you buy the instrument to encourage you to get your instruments calibrated every year. So they're actually a little bit cheaper than when you buy a calibration uh, when you actually need the calibration. And again, here's another bit.ly link, the time in factory. Right now we have a promotion that uh, we will calibrate your instruments. There's a bunch of caveats, but we'll calibrate your instruments in three weeks or the calibration is free. So you can check out that bit.ly link for more details on that. So again, the back at factory time is once a year, we recommend it coming back. And maybe you've already bought a calibration voucher when you have money at the start of your project. And hopefully you'll have your instruments back within three weeks. So this was all at RBR in general. And I'm gonna now talk about the RBR Solo D Wave. So the part of this section was, how do I pick the right instrument? 95% of the time, if you wanna measure waves, the RBR Solo D Wave 16 is the correct instrument. So again, this is from my experience in the past few years of doing this. This is the product I actually sell the most of. So specifically, how does the RBR Solo D Wave 16 capture waves? It does, uh, oh, sorry, I should say that the, the user friendliness and the, um, the, the cost part are the same kind of across all RBR instruments. So I'm not gonna go into the details. We just covered those for uh, just in general. So the Wave 16, the Solo D Wave 16 is gonna focus on how it captures waves. So it does have up to 16 Hertz sampling as does any Wave 16 version. Um, this particular one has one AA battery inside of it. So it, it can actually measure almost two months on a single AA battery continuously. So you have it on all the time. And the well sampled wave part is completely customizable. You can pick the period of how long you want uh, the, the kind of cycle to repeat. So like bursting for you know 17 minutes and how are you gonna do that every half an hour, every hour, every two hours, that's completely customizable. So you can really make sure that you're getting all that information. So I am gonna go into Ruskin, but I just wanted to quickly show this kind of piece here that um, these, are, these are the screenshots. So you can see I've set it up in wave, four hertz sampling, the 4096, as you may or may not recall, cause I'm talking very fast. That is 17 minutes of sampling. So it's turning on for 17 minutes. In that 17 minutes period, it's taking four samples every single second. And it's repeating this every hour. So the logger is on for 17 minutes, off for the rest of the hour, on for 17 minutes, off for the rest of the hour. And here you can actually see that you're gonna get, uh, 191 days of battery life, essentially, before you have to go and collect the data. So you're getting that months long deployment that you probably would prefer to do instead of going out, say once a month to uh, download the data and change the battery. However, the other 5% of the time, we have so many other options. Uh, I just put this here, like if you're unsure, if you're like, oh, I actually need a longer deployment or whatever, uh, email us at info at rbr-global.com to talk to somebody on the sales team about picking the right one for you. Uh, you can see this is just some of the options that we have. So we have uh, things with temperature, things that are larger to have more battery capacity and things for deeper deployments like the Quartz Q Plus. So again, 95% of the time, Solo D Wave 16 is what you need to measure waves. If you need to deploy longer than say two to three months, the Virtuoso D Wave 16 is exactly the same sensor. It has all the same benefits. It still uses Ruskin, but there's more batteries inside of it. So that means you actually have a longer autonomy. And I'm gonna show you that in the next section when we talk about Ruskin. Uh, maybe you're sampling frequency. Maybe you wanna sample even faster. You can get 32 Hertz sampling in our, a lot of our instruments. Um, so that's also a possibility if you want more parameters. So not just wave data, you want temperature, you want 
uh, conductivity or salinity, we have almost any possible configuration, CTD and wave 16. And on um, the previous slide, we showed a maestro as well. So you could get CTD with oxygen in a wave logger. It's, it's all customizable. Um, the Solid D wave 16 actually is good up to about 50 meters uh, to actually to be able to detect surface waves. The Quartz Q plus is probably correct if you need something deeper. So that one has a pyroscientific pressure sensor inside. So it has a, a better accuracy and resolution so it can detect surface waves um, one, beyond 50 meters uh, mean water depth. And honestly, one piece that keeps coming up time and time again for folks is that they actually wanna be able to hide the instrument. So the Solid D Wave 16 is actually smaller than the Virtuoso D. So even like, is this easy to hide or is it easy to deploy? Sometimes ends up being um, a question of, you know, which instrument do I need to use? So again, there, we probably have the right wave instrument depending on what you need. It, likely this one, but it could be sort of any other configuration. Okay, so that is this part. So uh, I'm just gonna show you a couple of these instruments I actually have on hand here. So this is a Solo D Wave 16. Uh, it's really easy to open up. You can see the batteries inside here. Um, I think the next most common wave logger that we have is the Virtuoso D Wave 16. So you can kind of see the size difference here. So the Virtuoso has eight AA batteries. The Solo has one AA battery. And now I'm gonna start showing you Ruskin and then you'll see what that means in terms of the battery life. So I'm going to share my screen again, pull up Ruskin. Okay, so there are four specific things I wanna show you in Ruskin today. The first one is enabling advanced sampling controls. So if you do have Ruskin on your computer and you are interested in waves, I would recommend you actually do this along with me. Uh, so this is Ruskin, you can see here, it's a Mac. So if you're on a PC, this might be in a slightly different place. If you go to Ruskin and preferences, you're gonna to go to this general tab here and under sampling control, you want enable advanced sampling controls on. So mine is on, so it has a little tick mark and you can apply and close. And I'm gonna show you why I have that on here. Um, in just a second when I simulate some instruments. So again, Ruskin is really awesome. <laughs> There's lots of cool features. Well, one thing here is I'm not actually gonna plug in these instruments I have next to me. I can simulate these instruments in Ruskin to actually look at the battery autonomy. If I change the, the battery chemistry, it tells me how much different like an alkaline versus a lithium battery uh, will last. So if we go to instruments here and simulate an instrument, if I stick in this compact logger suite, I'm gonna go down to solo D and I wanna make it a wave logger. So under options, I'm going to click wave 16 and you can see now I've generated an RBR solo D wave 16, like I said, my favorite instrument. And I'm also gonna go back up and simulate another instrument, simulate an instrument. And then I'm gonna to go to the standard instruments panel instead. It defaults to CTD. So I'm going to click this first one and put in pressure. That's how we measure waves. And then I'm gonna click this kind of blank panel and you can see it's generating a virtuoso D and I wanna make sure I put in that wave 16 feature as well. So I have what I need here. I'm gonna hit okay. So I have two different um, things simulated here. We're gonna go back to the solo. <clears throat> So uh, there are lots of things to point out in Ruskin. Um, when I go back to my slides, I think I have a link to our YouTube channel, which has a bunch more Ruskin functionality things. I'm just gonna focus on the wave stuff today. So you can see this is set up in wave mode. There's these other modes that I mentioned set up in continuous when you get the wave feature. Uh, at four Hertz, let's do the example from the presentation, which was 40, 96 samples. So this duration is number of samples. So in this configuration, this is about 17 minutes. And this interval is every 30 minutes, but let's put in the one hour because that's what I had in the presentation. So you can see here, oh, I'm on the virtual, so sorry. Let me go back to the solo. Um, it's the same, let's put in the 4096 and the one hour and then the zeros, here we go. So you can see that's where the 191 days um, came from earlier. Um, Right, so then I wanna, so I've 
if I set up the Virtuoso, which is the larger logger in the exact same configuration, you can see that the battery life is over two years. So if you really want this longer deployment, then the Virtuoso is the way to go. Again, everything else, the, the sensor, all the features and everything uh, are the same. It's just that the Virtuoso is larger so you can get more battery life essentially out of it. So the, the next thing I wanted to show, oh wait, there's one really fun trick that I have here. So this is again, 17 minutes every, um, 17 minutes and four seconds every hour. So it actually tells you right here that the schedule is valid. I'm gonna move this actually a little bit so you can see this. <clears throat> so if I put in 17 minutes here, you see that I get this warning down here that says the minimum interval is 17 minutes and five seconds. So because this is bursting 17 minutes, four seconds, I can't repeat that every 17 minutes because it's not having enough time to burst. So my favorite tip is to optimize the deployment is to put in exactly what it tells me is invalid down here. So now what's happening, instead of the instrument being on for 17 minutes, and four seconds every hour. It's on 17 minutes and four seconds every 17 minutes and five seconds. So what this means is that your instrument is only off for one second. So you see here that the battery autonomy, now we're down to uh, about two months. And if I move this into continuous mode, you can, you'll notice that the battery life is essentially the same. So by doing this little trick of essentially setting it up exactly to fit into the time series, you're doing uh, like I said, 17 minutes and four seconds of data and just one second break, you're really optimizing your continuous sampling and getting all these super awesome wave parameters like significant wave height and significant wave period. So your logger is on all the time. So you're really not going to miss uh, any of the waves. Uh, if you can do that, if the 54 days is long enough, and again, you can do the same thing in uh, with a virtuoso. And let me do the 17 zeros, 17, five. And here um, you'll get, uh, what's that, about nine months out of, out of the battery. So that's a great, that's my favorite tip is to like really maximize the, the wave data. Um, okay, so here you can see um, there are a couple other parameters you can put in. So mean depth of water, is exactly what that sounds like. So how deep is the water typically where you're gonna be deploying? Uh, for lots of folks, it's around 10 meters that I speak to. And you can see here, this instrument altitude means how far off the bottom of the water is the instrument. So for most folks, that's probably zero. You're either right on the seafloor or maybe you're half a meter or a meter above. So I'm gonna pretend I have a, a mooring that has the instrument about a half a meter off the bottom. This is the planning part that Rust can really Rust can, can really help with, that it's telling you the minimum wave period is around five seconds or four and a half seconds. So if you know what wave period you're trying to capture, you can actually use this to determine, is it possible based on the math essentially that's going on in Ruskin. If you can deploy from a pier or a dock, you can actually get the instrument much closer to the surface. So maybe you're actually getting it at 9.5 meters. So you're just below the surface. And in this case, then you can see that you get a much shorter wave period. So the tip here is that the closer you are to the surface, the shorter the period, the wave period. However, as you're probably aware, it's really hard to get instruments close to the surface unless you are using something like a pier or a dock because you're not, maybe not gonna have like a mooring system deployed from the bottom that has an instrument, you know, nine and a half meters up in the water column. Um, but this is a, just a good tip to know you know, am I gonna capture the wave period that I'm interested in? Okay, the last thing I wanna cover in Ruskin is um, a relatively new-ish feature um, called, sorry, I'm just moving. It's called auto tasks. So there are three. So auto, auto download means once the logger has been out and deployed, you bring it back. Once it's actually turned on, mine is turned off. Um, once you plug it in, it will automatically download all the data. So you don't have to go in here and actually click this download button. It'll just do it automatically. Auto stop. I don't know if you've uh, noticed or used RBR instruments in the past, but you can see that there's no choice of an end date here. So once you pull one of these loggers out of the water, say the Solo D Wave 16, um, it's keep, it, it keeps measuring in air as you take it out of the water. So this way, as soon as you plug it in, it will automatically stop the deployment. 
And the third feature, which I think is probably the most relevant for this audience is called auto deploy. So typically, again, talking to customers over the past few years, most people will have more than one wave logger. So the auto deploy is really powerful. You can set up one instrument, plug it in with the cable that comes with it. You set up all the features like the four hertz sampling, 4096, 1705. You put in local time when you want it to start and then you enable it super fast if you know what you're doing. So it's, you know, maybe take less than a minute to set it up. And then when you have the auto deploy on, you can take the next logger, you just plug it in and it automatically takes all the settings you put into the first logger onto the second logger. And you don't have to click any buttons. You literally plug, plug the instrument in and then you move on to the next instrument, close it up and it's good to go. So this is a really, really useful feature again in Ruskin that'll save you a bunch of time and less user error because the computer is programming every single one um, as you do that. Okay. So let me just go back to my presentation. Whoops. <clears throat> I bring up the Zoom screen share. Okay. So we covered the advanced sampling control. So that gives you more flexibility in the burst period, essentially, like how often you're repeating the burst. Um, how to simulate the solar D wave 16 and the virtuoso D wave 16. And the difference basically is the battery, essentially. Um, what wave periods can be captured based on the mean water depth and how close you are to the surface, essentially, and the auto tasks. Uh, again, I mentioned this earlier, you can copy this bitly, we'll be sending out the links later, uh, but more tips on Ruskin and like how to read all the other pieces of Ruskin uh, are on our YouTube channel. All right, so moving into the last section is uh, practical maintenance and deployment tips. So this is best practices to ensure you have a successful deployment. Um, there are four pieces to the maintenance. I'm gonna cover them quickly and best practices from other folks uh, based again on conversations. So uh, we have this desiccant. So desiccant is like the little packet of silica beads when you buy a new fanny pack or a new backpack or a new purse. It's, you know, they're in a little, that little like packet that kind of feels like salt. Uh, we just, we, we put them in a different format so that uh, we can actually recharge them. So, and they'll fit inside of our instruments. Again, a bitly for any, um, if you wanna learn how to recharge them, you could cook them essentially. Um, you can see they have these little caps on them. So you take the beads out. Uh, so the newer instruments will have these, uh, these rechargeable ones with, and bright orange is what you wanna see. So that means that they're fresh, they're ready to absorb the water. Uh, this dark green is bad. Uh, we have these older desiccants too. If you, ha I'm guessing probably at this point, anybody who has these are probably completely spent. They're probably all used up because it's been over a year, I think since we introduced the new desiccant. But if you do have the older ones, you can see these ones don't have a lid, so they can't be recharged. Um, when they're white, it's very, very bad. So why does desiccant matter? It's basically um, water from just the logger being like in the atmosphere where you close it up, uh, water can get on the electronics. These battery contacts can corrode and that will increase the sleep current and shorten your autonomy, which we've talked about how important that is to actually be able to like put your instruments in the water for the time that you want them in the water. So changing the desiccant is really important to ensure that uh, you're getting the autonomy that you expect. A couple of my favorite tips for desiccant is to store them in the uh, fresh desiccant in a glass jar. So it comes in a plastic container and a plastic bag. Uh, the moisture can seep in over time. So I would stick to uh, taking them and dumping them into a glass jar, just the, the little packets like this. Um, we do recommend replacing your desiccant after every single deployment, or if you're good enough about sticking to the color guide that bright orange is good and this dark green is bad, then you can do that. Um, and I like to save up a bunch and cook them at the same time. So uh, the Solo D Wave 16 has just one of these desiccant things. So I like to cook a, you know, a bunch of my desiccant all at once. And again, there's spares in the support kit that comes with it, I think nine different ones. So you know, if you cook maybe four or five at a time. O-rings. So O-rings, it basically keeps the instrument from flooding. 
Um, you need to replace them when they're damaged, dirty, or worn. It's the thing that you need to replace the least of the three consumables that we have, essentially. You can see a lot of these here are damaged and everything. Um, I would be very careful to inspect my O-rings every single time that the logger is open. Uh, something as small as a piece of hair or dirt can actually break the O-ring seal. So you just wanna be really diligent about the O-ring. Um, you know, make sure you're using clean hands or possibly even gloves. Uh, ensure you're using lint-free wipes and not things actually like a Q-tip actually has lots of fibers in it and use the O-ring grease that we supply. Um, again, bit.ly link for the instructions for our doc site about how to actually change the O-rings is right here. So one of my tips for the O-ring from replacing them on my wave logger is take a photo of what it looks like when it's open because the Solo D Wave 16 has two different types of O-rings. So you can see this one is more square, this one is rounder. Um, that's just a tip that I need myself uh, to use gloves when doing it. And instead of replacing every time like the desiccant, you can replace when it's needed. So for a long deployment over a year, I would definitely replace the O-rings after every deployment. If you're doing say a five week deployment, a six month deployment, you know, again, replace it when needed, make sure you're looking at it and inspecting them every time that you open up the locker. Um, the last thing is the batteries. So there's one AA battery inside the Solo D Wave 16. Uh, it's really easy to pop out and pop a new one in. Um, make sure you're using a brand name battery. Uh, you wanna make sure it's installed the right way. Actually inside here, um, there is a, a label on the back part of the pane here to show you which direction the battery goes in. I would recommend replacing the battery every single time just for peace of mind. Um, even if Ruskin tells you you have six months and you deployed for like three months, I would just replace it because the cost of losing that data is much, much more than one AA battery. Um, keep the battery shelf life in mind as well. Uh, batteries actually have, um, a lot of them have uh, called expiry dates on them, so check that as well. Um, and then if you're like unsure about battery chemistries and everything, you can use Ruskin to help you choose. Uh, again, you can head to our YouTube page and I think there's a video on the difference in using alkalines and lithiums in your uh, deployment calculation. Uh, and this is actually the type of battery we currently ship with in the wave loggers, which is an EVE lithium thionyl chloride battery. The cleaning part, I would say the most, hmm, I don't want to say the most important part. My top tip for the cleaning is to prevent the cleaning by using tape. So you can take the loggers and you can wrap them in tape like um, painter's tape or uh, masking tape or something like that. And then when they come out of the water, because typically they're moored for a while, you can just cut the tape off and then the logger is as good as new underneath. Um, you can also paint it, the tape, not the instrument, because use tape. If you're not using tape, then you have to be careful about cleaning the instruments that you're not damaging the sensor or like gouging anything out. And the instruments must be cleaned before returning to Ottawa for servicing and calibration. So if we get a dirty instrument, we're gonna charge you for a cleaning fee because it does take time for us to clean them. So my top tip again for this section is just use tape uh, to, to cover the instruments up, which is gonna be useful in the next section as well. So deployment tips. So these basically come from, again, me ch chatting with folks about how they deploy their instruments or what mistakes that, that they've made in the field. So this is my very excellent drawing that I'm an artist, clearly. We have uh, some waves, the water here. We have a buoy at the surface, mooring line, uh, some bottom and an anchor, super simple. If you put the instrument at the surface, what ends up happening, like if you put it on the buoy, as the waves come by, the buoy moves up and down and so will the logger. So I haven't touched on this again. <laughs> you can find YouTube videos about the pressure sensors and how it's measuring uh, the depth and then the waves and everything. But essentially the wave logger will move up and down with the waves instead of measuring the waves as it's coming over. So you don't wanna mount the logger on the buoy because you're gonna miss the very thing you're trying to measure. You wanna mount it from the bottom. So now as the waves are passing, it's actually detecting the changes in the pressure at the surface. You also wanna make sure that you use plenty of weight. 
I know somebody who once tried to deploy a wave logger before a hurricane to catch these like awesome hurricane level waves and they didn't use enough weight. And luckily they, they caught the mooring, but it started to hop out of the harbor. Um, and then again, it's not catching the waves because it's moving with the waves. So use more weight than you think that you need is my recommendation for that. So I mentioned earlier, the easiest way probably to deploy a wave logger is on a Docker pier. You can just attach it and then you can get really short period waves by attaching it really close to the surface. Um, however, the downside to that is sometimes if it's in a public place, vandalism can be an issue. So people sometimes are nosy and they like, will take it out and look at it. Some people will actually steal it. Some people will try to destroy it. So um, you know, if it is in a public place or you just want to be careful, again, the tape is a really great option. These instruments are yellow, so uh, easy to see in the water. If you have a private dock, maybe that's the way to go, but you can cover it in tape, you know, blue tape or a brown tape if it fits into the, the color or even like a silver tape to make it a little bit less conspicuous in the water. We also recommend that you point the sensor face down. So the sensor is here on this end. Um, and it's very, very unlikely to happen, but the reason we recommend it is because there are holes in the, um, in the set, uh, to protect the sensor. There's a case on here and there are holes in the case. So if it's facing up, sometimes sediment can get in there and get impacted and damage the sensor. Again, that's very, very uncommon, but just to avoid the possibility at all, just point the sensor down. Uh, it keeps, keeps it pretty easy. And finally, uh, some people actually bury their instruments in the sand on beaches to measure like the waves coming in from the beach. Uh, if you are deploying on a beach, let us know. We have some specific tips about uh, from a customer again about how to keep the sediment out of those little holes. Uh, so you're actually measuring beach waves coming in. Okay, sorry, that was so fast. I'm leaving these bit.ly resources up here. Uh, and again, we'll be sending out them because I spoke about them. Uh, you know, the three free calibration, the tips on our YouTube, uh, a waves webinar focused really, really on the theory part, how to recharge the desiccant, how to change the O-rings. Those are all there. So you can take a screenshot or again, we'll send them out later. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing. Uh, KJ, is there any questions? Why do you put duration and not number of samplings? Let me see. I'm going to put rest in. Um, so duration is, because in the tide, we also have a tide feature that I didn't talk about at all today. In the tide feature, uh, there's also a, a duration, which is actually time. So it's a little bit confusing. Um, we, we could put number of samples, but I mean, it's, if, you, if you know what it is, it's pretty easy to do that, but I'll, I can make a note about that. Are there any other questions? Yeah, so uh, the question is, can, why is using the, um, let me just do this again. <clears throat> why is using this trick about the 1705 better than using continuous? So in continuous mode, you're getting, um, you'll actually see down here, you get pressure, which is what we're actually measuring. C pressure, which is subtracting atmospheric pressure and depth, which is derived. So these two are derived. So with continuous sampling, you're getting those parameters, those three parameters in a continuous time series. When you are operating in wave mode, you also get those in addition to many, many, many other parameters. Uh, let me just, sorry, stop sharing for a second and see if I can find that slide. Mm. Oh, 
Oh, actually, I can do this. So you can see here that with the wave processing, you're getting the tidal slope, significant wave height, significant wave period, one tenth of those things, the maximums, the average, and the wave energy. So you're getting the measured parameters that you do with continuous, as well as all of these other process data. So that's where the power of the wave uh, 16 feature comes in is that it's not just giving you a continuous time series of the pressure or of the depth, it's giving you that in addition to all of these statistics. Um, so that's why it's better in my opinion, because you're getting the best of both worlds. You're getting that continuous, essentially continuous data record and then you can process that data yourself if you want, or you can take the RBR calculated um, stats, wave stats as well. <clears throat> Yeah, so um, if you use this, the so that's exactly it, the, the, the 1705 trick or whatever period that you're doing trick, it, like I said, it's the best of the both worlds. It's essentially a continuous data set in addition to getting the wave parameters as well. Any other questions? Oh. Ah, yes. <laughs> so, um, sorry, I'm like reading the question. So uh, I did have like other commonly asked questions. And one that's very common is wave direction. Are these directional wave sensors? So these are not directional wave sensors. <laughs> There's a couple of complicated answers, but basically it's not directional. Um, so here are a few extra recommendations for directional waves. So if you have one sensor, you're measuring the pressure here, so you can't tell where it's coming from. Uh, if you can sync it well, which these wave laggers actually do a pretty good job of it because the clock drift is a maximum of a minute a year. So if you set it up right, maybe using the auto deploy, you could put, we do have customers that use a series, right? They'll use like three or four to see, oh, we're seeing the pressure here, here, here. So you can do that. That's it's, it's a little bit complicated because if the waves are coming in very fast or multi-direction, it's kind of hard to see where they're coming from. So uh, for directional wave measurements, uh, I think you can use like ADCPs or ADVs. We have this other thing that we started, we did a couple of years ago for the first time. And essentially what it is, is we have an RBR, like a logger like this, that has the eight batteries and we have cabled pressure sensors coming into it so that I think of it uh, like an octopus or like a spaghetti, because there's cabled pressure sensors. So you could have a pressure sensor on the body and then like multiple other pressure sensors. And then the clock sync is actually much better because it's all on one clock inside the logger instead of one clock inside of this logger and one clock inside of a different logger because those clocks are gonna drift at different rates. Whereas this has one clock inside that's controlling sort of all the external sensors. Um, so that's another way of doing the directional waves using our bigger instruments. So if we don't have a simple answer, <laughs> get a complicated one, I guess. Uh, so there, there are definitely ways of measuring directional waves. Um, again, if you're interested in it, maybe reach out to us and we can have that conversation about, you know, how fast are the waves coming in, which configuration or which product is actually the way to go. Oh, okay. so um, let's look, let's go back to the Ruskin again to look at the, the battery life. I just want to double, double check this. Ah, okay. Oops, sorry, I'm just gonna share my screen again. <clears throat> okay, so the question was like the battery life. Um, what is this like a live reading of the battery? So essentially, um, this is if you're using a brand new fresh battery. Um, with lithium batteries, you can go to this information tab and I don't have the thing plugged in, but lithium batteries have a really sharp drop off in the, in the voltage inside. So basically you have like full voltage, full voltage, and then it drops off really quickly. So this isn't like, uh, if you plug it in, this is just estimating it from how long it's been sampling already, essentially. So 
it's, it's really hard to use the voltage of a lithium battery to actually determine uh, well, as it's being spent, because it's, like I said, it's like high, 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 and then it drops off really quickly. Um, so I, I don't know if that was a great answer to the question. So it's, you know, it, that's assuming it's a fresh battery. And then yeah, as time goes on, it does, it will give you sort of an updated of what is going, like what it thinks is happening. But I would recommend again, using a fresh battery to start and maybe keeping track of that somewhere. Um, and so you can kind of know how long it's, how much of the battery is eaten up. If it's been in the water for, you know, a week, then you know that you have plenty of battery life left if you are trying to get to a month, for example. Uh, but again, I, I am much more cautious. If you're not sure if there's enough battery juice, just replace the batteries because the cost of losing your data is going to be much, much more of a pain than the cost of a few extra batteries. Oh yeah, sorry. Um, yes, so the question is, um, like on the end here, you can see there's like a little uh, line. Uh, so the actual sensor is this, the metal that you can see and this plastic cover is to protect the sensor because, uh, you know, I could accidentally like jab my finger in and actually hurt the membrane itself or damage the membrane. So you can actually remove this cap. So if it does get full of sediment, so, uh, you know, I talked about sediment coming down from the top, but if you're deployed at the bottom and there's currents going by and moving sediment and everything around, uh, this can also get filled with sediment. So you can just unscrew that. Uh, a nickel works. You can just put it in there and unscrew it and just be really gentle once it's actually uncovered, that you're not damaging it. Um, running uh, some water over it, uh, just fresh water, will clean it out. And if it's really, really stuck, um, you can use like a vinegar bath for a little bit to get things removed, but just be gentle that you're not damaging the center, the sensor. Mm. So the question is, is the wave processing free? So Ruskin is free. And when you buy an instrument, uh, it'll say kind of what the features are. So the feature is wave 16. So there is a difference in the price between say a solo D wave or sorry, a solo D and a solo D wave 16. This is, so it's a firmware thing. So uh, when you buy an instrument, um, you will get it configured. So if you do have the wave processing, when you plug it in, you'll see those wave features. If you don't have the wave processing, you'll see continuous, say if you have a solo D. Uh, if you do get a solo D and you have it at 20 meter or 50 meter, you can actually remotely upgrade to the wave processing later with our support team by paying the difference between the two uh, instruments. Another tip. I'm going to read this one out loud. Uh, we deploy tide gauges and lagoons on a post that is driven into the bottom. And the instrument is typically gets buried in the sediment after a while. Tips to which way to deploy the gauges to keep the sediment out of the sensor. So I alluded to this earlier that I have customers. Uh, so it's Nina Stark at Virginia Tech, who's a big wave person. She uses a geotech textile fabric um like if you walk by construction sites you know and, and they have like this kind of like plastic coating around the fence that's what it is i often think of it as pantyhose and i don't think that's really what it is but you can put something over here so you can see these small holes here you can put like a cloth over it but it needs to be porous enough so that the water can get in to actually hit the sensor so covering it in like tin foil is not going to work uh, so if you have something that has smaller a much smaller hole size. Again, if you know your sediment size, which obviously you're in the field doing it, so you probably have a, a good idea for that. You can just cover it and then uh, use a rubber band. So um, like, again, I think of it as pantyhose. It's not pantyhose, but you can get different, uh, different like size holes for that geotextical um, fabric and put on there to keep the sediment out. Um, it depends on which way the sediment is coming in as well. Like if it's getting buried from the top, then, you know, having the sensor facing up is not a great idea. Uh, if it's like going into the sediment, again, putting it downward is the sediment's gonna get forced up there. So I think the, the best way then is actually to try to prevent the sediment getting in there before it actually goes in the water. And typically like if it's 
sideways. So maybe put the fabric on it and try to mend it sideways if that's possible. I know it's a pole, so it's a little bit more complicated, but um, if you did that, then depending again, the currents, what's going on in there, it, the sediment coming this way might not get as it, into the holes as easily as doing it this way or this way. So I would use, like I said, uh, some sort of panty hose. <laughs> with holes to make sure the sediment doesn't get into the holes. Yeah. I think I answered all of the questions. Um, sorry, I just wanted to go back to the battery thing in Ruskin one more time because it was kind of a second a secondary piece and I just want to explain two more things. Um, so um, first of all, this, okay, so this is the solo D wave. This is defaulting to the lithium thionyl chloride battery. Um, if I change it to alkaline, you can see that the life, the battery life goes down much, much more. So that's one thing that you can change the battery life. I mentioned this earlier, depending on the configuration. So this is a rechargeable nickel metal hydride battery. You can see this also changes the battery life. So we want you to get the longest deployment. So that's why we're using these um, lithium thionyl chloride LTC batteries. Um, this battery calculation is also based, assuming that the water is around five degrees Celsius. So if it's much colder than that, you want to derate this battery life a little bit. Um, so we, we try to get this like spot on and not too conservative, um, or, uh, you know, so it's not, you're not over underestimating, you're actually getting the right amount. So, um, yeah. Okay. There seems to be no other open questions and we're seven minutes uh, to the hour. So I'm, give, I'm gonna give you all that seven minutes back. Thanks so much for coming today. Uh, we will be sending a follow-up email uh, with some resources and everything and the recording will be available. So that's gonna be fun for you. You can listen to it at like four speed on YouTube and see if it makes any sense <laughs> with my very fast talking. Uh, so I'm going to leave it to KJ to close this out by ending the meeting. Thank you.